One of the more popular types of videos that are featured on YouTube is the genre of dangerous science experiments. Everyone knows about the geyser that ensues when you add Mentos into a bottle of Coke, specifically Coke, not Pepsi, or the violent exothermic reaction that results when pure sodium is dropped into water, or the deadly chloramine gas that forms when bleach and ammonia meet. We're also familiar with other types of deadly mixtures, such as alcohol and Tylenol. But for the Jewish people, there is an additional list of mixtures that we must steadfastly avoid, several of which are mentioned in our Parsha. All of these fall under the general term known as kiloyim, or mixed species. For instance, it's forbidden to mix, to grow grapes in close proximity to any species of grain or legumes. It's prohibited to graft different types of species of trees together. And most famously, it is prohibited to wear garments that contain both wool and linen, a prohibition known as shotness. And finally, there is a prohibition of plowing a field using an ox and a donkey harnessed together. The laws of shotness have long been applicable albeit not as widely known or universally observed. But in the COVID era, where so many have turned to gardening and sustenance and for sustenance and peace of mind, perhaps the prohibition of mixed planting and grafting have become relevant. But it is the last type of mixture that in a non-agrarian society and a virtual world that we live in, this last sort of forbidden mixture of kilayim between an ox and a donkey are quite difficult to relate to or to understand. Why is it so terrible, after all, to harness a donkey and an ox together? Among the commentators, we find several different approaches to this enigmatic prohibition. Ibn Ezra explains that the prohibition safeguards against uh, unnatural breeding of two different species together. Other commentators, like the Rambam and Chizkuni, Rab Chizkia ben Manoach of the 13th century in France, feel that it is designed to prevent tsar balichai, cruelty to animals. The Chizkuni explains, he elaborates, that the discrepancy in strength between an ox and a donkey, the latter is much more powerful a beast of burden than is the ox, leads to unequal workload between the two. At the expense of the donkey, of course, because if you're doing more, the lion's share of the work, if you're doing the donkey's share of the work, then why should you have to watch your counterpart doing less work? The Sefer Chinuch, takes this notion of tsar balichai, of cruelty to animals, in a different direction. The Sefer Chinech, this prohibition is about emotional pain which is caused to animals beyond the physical pain. Let me read the words of the Sefer Chinech. Mitame ha-mitzah zu inyin tsar balichai, shu asr mena tor v'yadu shi yesh l'minye behemus l'ovos daiga gedola lishkoim she'ena mina. It causes animals and birds great worry, great anguish to have to dwell with creatures that are not members of its own kind, of its own species. That when birds choose to dwell in certain habitat, they like to live among their own species. Behemoths, animals like to live among their own species. To force an animal, to chain an animal with a species that is not of the same kind is a form of emotional tsar balichai. According to the Chinuch, animals have a sense of inner worth. An inner worth based upon their own experiences, their tasks, their associations, that there are certain things that are simply beneath their own kavod, beneath their own self-worth. And this exquisite level of sensitivity that we must show to animals is not limited to the animal kingdom. In fact, the Sefer Chinuch takes it one step further and extends this paradigm to the human dynamic. V'chol chacham leiv. Anyone who is wise of heart, says the Chinuch, mizeh yikach moser will take musr, will take rebuke from this. Don't force two people who are so dramatically different in their behavior and their nature to work together. Like the righteous and the evildoer, the slight person, the honorable one. Because if the Torah were, was exacting about the pain that must be shown to animals, and all the more so must we show that emotional sensitivity to human beings. The message of the Chinuch is a powerful one. There are several practical applications in our lives. When it comes to parenting, we have a tendency to put children into a box, 
a prescribed regimen of social and academic pursuits and milestones that we deem necessary and appropriate for that child, whether it's soccer practice, piano lessons, building blocks to achieve a certain madrega by the age of six months, or AP calculus. Sometimes the decisions we render for children are ill-conceived and they place an undue burden of expectation upon their shoulders. We set them up in doing so for failure. When we force them into roles and pursuits that are simply unnatural and radically unusual to who they are as a person. The goal of a parent ought to be to set up a child for success so that they can shine in their own way while exposing them, of course, to reasonable challenges. We don't want to not challenge them. We expose them to reasonable challenges to grow beyond their comfort zone, but not to put them in a box and not to put them into a place where they are set up for failure. The late Dame Jillian Lynn, who just uh, passed away in 2018, was one of the most famous choreographers ever. She choreographed two of the longest running musicals in Broadway, Cats and Phantom of the Opera. There was an interview uh, with Ken Robinson, who passed away this past week, where he describes how she told of the difficulties that her parents experienced with her as a child. She simply could not sit still in school, and the school wrote to her parents a long letter telling them that she suffered from attention disorder. Her mother took her to a learning specialist who immediately realized that she was trying to, make, trying to take in much more information than she was actually available uh, around her. Uh, Sir Ken tells the story that was, uh, that was viewed in a widely viewed TED Talk called How Do Schools Kill Creativity? And here is the quote. The doctor went and sat next to Jillian and then said, Jillian, I've listened to all the things your mother has told me. I need to speak to her privately. He said, wait here. We'll be back and we won't be very long. Dame Jillian then described what happened next. The minute they'd gone, I leapt up. I leapt up on the desk. I leapt up off, off of his desk. I danced all around the room. I had the most fabulous time. He said he immortalized. I really owe my whole career, in a way, and I suppose my life, to this man. He said there is nothing wrong with your child. She's a born dancer. Take her to a dance school. And so she did. Jillian Lynn was the donkey being forced to plow with a bunch of oxen. And thank God, someone had the, had the perspective to realize this, or the spirit of this artist would have been lost, would have been vanquished forever. And there's another important lesson which emerges from this insight of the Sefer HaChinuch. No one's sense of self should be defined by the way they choose to earn a living the house they inhabit, the academic degrees they've amassed. However, it is certainly human to feel that what we have studied, that what we have achieved in our lives entitles us to a certain level of respect, dignity, and recognition. You wouldn't ask Neil deGrasse Tyson to substitute a fourth grade math class, much as you wouldn't expect Serena Williams to coach you on your backhand or Mario Andretti to serve as the valet for your daughter's bat mitzvah which, by the way, if he's driving at his usual speed, is a terrible idea anyway. Chazal were aware of this reality when they exempted certain individuals from mitzvot whose performance would be deemed beneath their station. For example, an elderly person is not expected to scale a wall or to bend down really uncomfortably low to retrieve a lost object. Zakin ve'enel lefi chlodo. In our dealings with other people, we should be exquisitely sensitive to this point. Let us preserve the self-worth of others, their inner sense of kavod that others feel they deserve. Sometimes we, are, we feel compelled, morally obligated, to take haughty people down a few pegs, to put them in their rightful place. But remember, while we are cautioned to run away from kavod, to run away from honor ourselves, we must never deny kavod to another person. Rav Tzvi Hirsch Weinreb often says that giving kavod to others is the cheapest gift that you can ever give. It costs the giver nothing and it makes the recipient feel wonderful. If we would afford this treatment to animals, if we would be sure not to take away from the cover that they should feel that they are taken down from their level of deserved respect, why then would we hesitate to do so for our fellow man? Good job.